Good day, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Military and Foreign Affairs Network. I am your host, the Voice of Reason. Today, we are continuing our ongoing coverage of the war between the Russian Federation and Ukraine. So as we continue our coverage, there is a continued discussion about the Wagner Rebellion. Uh, there is continued discussion about the perceived weakness of Vladimir Putin, the Kremlin leadership, and even the Russian military because of this movement of Wagner forces that had moved on Rostov-on-Don and uh, the uh, city in the north of Voronezh. Now, if you look at what happened, if you look at this movement of Wagner forces and, and what they did, would things have looked quite a bit different if they were not Wagner forces? If they were, let's say, Ukrainian forces, NATO forces? Absolutely. You cannot look at what happened with these Wagner forces and say that was a normal reaction by the Russian military. You have to understand that the Russian armed forces and there are different entities that are continuing to fight against the Ukrainians that are involved within the Russian armed forces. You have the Russian ground forces, you have the Russian VDV, you have the Russian GRU, you have FSB, National Guard, Wagner units, forces of Novo Russia, which is, have essentially been incorporated into the Russian military proper. So to see movements of Wagner formations moving around the battlescape, moving behind the, the line of contact, was not uncommon. And in all likelihood, it wasn't until Vladimir Putin actually spoke that then finally, things started to happen. Blocking forces started to occur. But it wasn't uncommon for these Wagner troops to be moving around both in Ukraine, in Novorossiya, in Russia itself. There's a, a large Wagner training facility in the uh, the south of the country, south of Rostov-on-Don. And I think this is where you have to look at the actual Wagner leadership. A lot of attention is being paid towards Prigozhin. Prigozhin is a close personal friend of Vladimir Putin. Now, is he still a close personal friend of Vladimir Putin? Difficult to say at this point. They held affections towards each other. But Prigozhin was a business leader. I believe uh, the, the front company was uh, Concord. Someone may, may uh, uh, correct me on that. And his, his mother has a, a huge stake. His mother was a doctor, has a huge stake in the uh, ownership of these of these different countries but that is not the brains behind Wagner and again I think you you've not seen a lot of this discussion take place in mainstream media and that's why we're going to talk about it today who's the real brains behind Wagner how did Wagner become such a good fighting force and it has proved itself to be very capable in the Russia-Ukrainian war. Well, it starts with a, a guy by the name of Dmitry Utkin. Lieutenant Colonel Dmitry Utkin. Now, Dmitry Utkin is the real deal. Not Prigozhin. Okay? No military background, essentially. But Dmitry Utkin 
different story. That is the alleged main founder of Wagner. Hence, he had the call sign Wagner. Dmitry Utkin commanded a unit. It was the 700th Detachment within the 2nd Spetsnaz Brigade. This is a, an elite unit within an elite unit. And that's what Lieutenant Colonel Dmitry Utkin commanded. 700th Spetsnaz Detachment, 2nd Brigade. So it'll be interesting to see what is the position of Dmitry Utkin in this ongoing issue between Bergosian, Shoigu, Gorasimov. Difficult to say at this point. But again, most of, if not all, of the actual leadership, battlefield commanders of Wagner, all come from Russian Spetsnaz. Or Russian Airborne. So at the end of the day, I, I, again, I don't think neither party was interested in seeing uh, lots of uh, Russian blood being shedded. And that's why we're seeing what is happening right now. Now, does this mean that the Kremlin is weak? And that, that's the narrative right now that you're hearing coming out of the mainstream media here in the United States. Well, because Wagner made this move to Rostov-on-Don in the north towards Moscow, that proves that the Russian military is shaky, that how on earth is it possible that this group of mercenaries were able to do what they did well behind Russian lines? Well, it was because it was normal. The average Russian battalion commander, company commander, within the ground forces, it was common to see Wagner formations moving around the battlefield. They worked together. Russian ground forces worked with Wagner units. They fought together. So to say that it was an issue in which the Russian military could have immediately reacted, it's not the case. And again, it wasn't really ground forces that engaged Wagner formations, from what we hear. It was actual Air Force units that engaged some elements of the uh, Wagner group as they were moving towards Moscow. But there was not a lot of reports of direct fighting between Russian ground forces, Russian National Guard, and other organizations within Russia fighting against Wagner. Again, it was common for those units to operate together and see themselves mo moving freely both towards the front line and behind the front line. Now, look, if, <laughs> if this would have been a Ukrainian unit, a NATO unit, and I think that's the association that is being made. Well, because Wagner did this, it would be very easy for a, a NATO unit to bust through Russian lines and go all the way to Moscow. You're, you're dreaming. It's just not what happened on the ground. It was lack of information. It was lack of understanding on what was happening. Lack of information. Which created the environment that everyone was watching on TV. Now... Look, Russia is going through, well, I don't want to say Russia, the Russian army is going through a massive change. It is being expanded at a rapid rate. And I think the West is kidding itself in terms of seeing what happened with Wagner as Russia becoming weaker. I think in, in all probability it's going to be just the opposite. 
I think in two years from now, the West is going to be looking east at an incredibly expanded Russian military. Probably three times the size of force that existed prior to the war between Ukraine and Russia. And, and, and namely, the, the ground forces are going to expand in a major way. We also understand that the, uh, the uh, naval infantry forces, the coastal defense forces, are also going to expand significantly. A lot of those uh, uh, naval infantry brigades are going to actually become divisions, and a lot of the, the Russian brigade structure that you now see is, going to, is being currently reformed into divisions. So in all likelihood, uh, we're going to see a Russian military that, or a Russian uh, ground force that was around 300,000 personnel at the start of the Ukrainian war, Russia-Ukrainian war, to probably close to a million strong ground force, just ground forces. While we'll also see the expansion of uh, GRU, we'll We'll see the expansion of, of, of Spetsnaz formations, the Special Operations Forces, the, uh, the VDV formations, the Air Mobile formations. And we'll probably see now Wagner become another entity within the Russian Armed Forces. How that will look like, uh, difficult to say at this point. But I think they'll keep unit cohesion. I don't think Wagner forces will be parceled out among the ground forces. I think they will try to keep unit cohesion and then those Wagner forces may be uh, called something different. But we'll have to see how that, uh, what happens with that actually. But uh, as we continue to watch uh, the, the conflict, again, we, we keep hearing about the Ukrainian offensive which has, again, as I've talked about before, essentially stalled with very limited gains in these areas that are now blue and, uh, and, and light green. And again, this area here is the main defensive line of Russian forces. And the Ukrainians essentially did not get even close to those main defensive lines because of the Russian use of air power, attack helicopters, and artillery. And the Ukrainians did not have the air defense envelope to support the columns of NATO-trained brigades that were trying to move on the main Russian defensive lines. They were unable to move forward, and they have sustained huge casualties. What we are hearing here at Military and Foreign Affairs Network is that the casualties among Ukrainian forces over the last month, including fighting that took place in Bakhmut and this new offensive, especially in Zaporizhia, were atrocious. The casualties were unprecedented. Entire units wiped out. And we're also hearing uh, that while morale in, in some Russian units are low, that the same thing is occurring within Ukrainian units as well. Incredibly low morale caused by massive casualties. And we, we continue to hear about this, at least here in the United States, about this esprit de corps in the Ukrainian military. We believe that that esprit de corps right now is, is not as high as it was at the start of the conflict, nowhere even near. And that is caused by large numbers of casualties. A lot of the Ukrainian forces now that we're seeing being uh, inducted into the Ukrainian military were, are not the same 
soldiers that started this conflict, a lot of those soldiers are dead or wounded. Or have seen so much shocking conflict, it's difficult for them to even go to the front lines. Brutal, brutal war taking place. Lots of casualties. And especially over the last 30 to 60 days, Ukrainian casualties have been off the charts. Really bad. Really bad. And compounding that, the Russians have been uh, uh, hitting uh, the Ukrainian rear areas in perpetuity, blowing up warehouses, hitting command and control sites, and really making it difficult for the Ukrainian military to supply its forces on the front lines. You know, anecdotal re reports are continuous about uh, Ukrainian artillery units fire uh, 5 to 20 rounds downrange, and they receive 500 rounds from the Russians, incoming artillery rounds. And then they're out of ammo. They're out of ammunition, the Ukrainians. And that's what we're seeing now in this uh, continued uh, offensive operation by the Ukrainians that has stalled. Again, casualties and, and lack of ammunition and supplies have, have really stalled this Ukrainian operation. And uh, again, we are continuing to receive information that the Russians are preparing for something quite large summer, end of summer. Now, will this actually happen? Difficult to say, but we are definitely seeing a buildup of Russian forces. Uh, also in uh, Bakhmut, uh, there has been talk about Wagner formations pulling out and regular uh, Russian ground force formations coming in. And that has happened. And many of these units that have been brought into Bakhmut are, are very high quality Russian airborne units. You have the 106th Guards Airborne Division, elements of the 98th Guards Airborne Division, including other units now in, in Bakhmut. And we anticipate, and we're going to continue to watch, the area north of Bakhmut all the way up to Seversk and north of Seversk near the criminal line. So, just wanted to have that discussion today. Thank you for joining us. More to come very, very soon. And as always, have a good day.